I'm Torsten, and this is joint work with uh, Thomas Schoeps and Mark Polifais uh, on BAT SLAM, button adjusted uh, direct RGBD SLAM. Um, contrary what to, to what the paper title suggests, we were actually interested in building a good SLAM system um, and trying to figure out what it takes to build a highly accurate SLAM system. And an obvious answer was, well, we would like to be able to run bundle adjustment in real time on dense data. And bundle adjustment is commonly used for feature-based SLAM where you have sparse measurements, but not really for direct SLAM where you typically have much denser measurements. Rather, it's common to approximate bundle adjustment, for example, using non-rigid map deformations, post-graph optimization where you enforce relative post constraints, or fragment-based optimization where you subdivide the scene into fragments and then optimize the alignment of the fragments. If bundle adjustment is used, then it's typically used in the context of sliding window uh, odometry. And that naturally leads to the question, is it feasible at all to run bundle adjustment for direct SLAM? And our answer to this is yes, and this is where our bad SLAM method comes into play. So we represent the scenes through a set of keyframes, where each keyframe observes a set of uh, circles, which model the scene geometry. And we chose circles rather than voxels to be able to uh, reconstruct the scene at arbitrary detail. In order to achieve real-time performance, we uh, sparsify the input we perform alternating optimization to keep each step efficient and implemented the whole approach on a GPU. Our bundle adjustment uh, scheme contains photometric and geometric residuals, which you optimize using Gauss-Newton, but there are also discrete circle update steps such as creating new circles, merging circles. Um, the movement of the circles is actually constrained along the surface normal, which we also optimize as part of the bundle adjustment. The adjustment is integrated into a standard SLAM system where there's a front end that tracks the camera pose in real time and a back end that performs bundle adjustment as soon as a new keyframe is created, potentially after post-graph optimization. Here's our method on one of the Tuma RGBD datasets where you can see that we are able to faithfully reconstruct the geometry and the, uh, of the scene and the trajectory of the camera. However, if you look at numbers, you will actually notice that our method, just as all other direct SLAM systems, performs worse than feature-based OPSLAM 2. The reason is that all of those methods make a couple of assumptions that are violated, but this seems to hurt direct methods much more. Uh, more precisely, most RGBD cameras actually have a uh, rolling shutter, which you would need to model. Similarly, uh, depths and color frames are not synchronously recorded, but might be asynchronous. And if you have, don't have an accurate calibration, there might be distorted depth measurements. Um, so how do we go dealing with those problems? Should we do this in software? The problem is that leads to high implementation effort, adds processing on top of everything else, and can even lead to degenerate cases in the case of rolling shutter. And our answer to this is this should actually be solved in hardware. So we decided to build our own sensor uh, and record a new benchmark data set. So what we offer is um, data captured with synchronized global shutter cameras that can be used to benchmark visual inertial monocular, stereo, and RGBD SLAM. Um, we compute, provide depth maps computed using active uh, infrared stereo, but we also make the raw measurements available. We get ground truth trajectories um, by using a motion capturing system for the indoor scenes, but also have a couple of outdoor scenes where we get ground truths from a multi-camera system and SLAM. So, on this well-calibrated benchmark, uh, what we have is uh, 61 training and six, uh, 35 test sequences where we withhold the ground rules of the test sequences and rather make an online service available for evaluation. Um, what we see on this well-calibrated data set is that direct message such as DVO SLAM uh, and our method can outperform OP SLAM 2 with our method performing best. So to summarize, uh, what I've shown is that direct bundle adjustment is uh, feasible in real time uh, as long as the scenes are not too large and performs very well if you get very good uh, input data, well calibrated input data. And we make our data sets and code available at eth3.net. Thank you very much.
Good morning. My name is Francesco Pitaluga. And my co-authors are Sanjeev Kopal, Singbin Kang, and Sudip Tassina. And our paper is titled, Revealing Scenes by Inverting Structure for Motion Reconstructions. So structure for motion is a process for generating a 3D map of a scene from a set of 2D images. Here we show a map of Rome that was estimated from 70, 75,000 tourist images. And these kind of maps are, are pre-computed for later use for many applications. One, one such application is augmented reality. In AR, SFM maps are pre-computed to perform fast camera localization, which is necessary to overlay digital content into the real world. And the focus of this presentation is to examine the privacy implications of this. Until now, the major privacy concerns with respect to AR devices has been the potential leakage of sensitive information from one of the many onboard sensors. In this presentation, we highlight a new kind of privacy attack. Specifically, we show for the first time that sparse SFM point clouds can be inverted to reconstruct a detailed and recognizable, or detailed and recognizable images of the scene. This shows that the privacy implications of persistent spatial mapping are more serious than what is currently assumed. So more formally, the attacker's goal is to reconstruct a color image of the scene from a 2D projection of a sparse 3D point cloud. And for the purposes of this project, we assume the attacker will train a deep neural network to perform this task. So while there has been no previous work on inverting 3D maps, there has been plenty of work on single image feature inversion, that is, on reconstructing an image from a set of features extracted from that same image. So what exactly is the difference between these two problems? Well, it mainly comes down to having less information to work with. So firstly, SFM points are, are highly sparse and have irregular 3D spatial distributions. Second, the visibility of the 3D points is unknown. Lastly, many feature attributes are not stored. This includes key point orientation and scale and descriptor source image information. So after projecting the 3D points, this leaves us with a sparse n-dimensional tensor containing some combination of depth, RGB, and sift. We use this tensor as the input to our model, which consists of a cascade of three neural networks. The first network, the ZibNet, produces a binary visibility map, which is used to filter out occluded points. The second network, CourseNet, takes the filtered input and produces a coarse RGB reconstruction. Lastly, the third network, RefineNet, is trained adversarially to produce the high quality output. Here we show a virtual tour of a scene produced using our approach. The input point cloud is shown on the left, our result in the middle, and the ground truth images on the right. As you can see, our result is very close to the ground truth. So our method can also be used to generate novel views as shown here. Here there's no actual ground truth because the views are novel. So now we examine the importance of VisibNet. So on the left, we see the visibility map produced by VisibNet with occluded points shown in red. Focusing on the selected area, we see that there is a high density of occluded points surrounding the sofa. This causes a model trained without VisibNet to incorrectly render the couch without a background. In contrast, when trained with VisibNet, the model correctly reconstructs the scene. So we now look at why uh, RefineNet is important. So we do this by comparing the outputs of CourseNet and RefineNet for four different scenes. And as you can see, RefineNet makes a big difference, well, as you will be able to see, RefineNet makes a big difference with respect to edges, color, and removing image artifacts. So even though the inputs are just depth and sift, it's, uh, refine is able to bring back all the color information. So we now look at the effect of using different input attributes as the input. So to do this, we train four models with different in input attributes, one with only depth, one with depth and sift, one with depth plus RGB, and a fourth with depth, sift, and RGB. And as you can see, all the models perform quite well, surprisingly, even when only depth is included. So of course it's helpful to have more information, but they, they still perform well. So here we show the output of our model for inputs with varying sparsity levels. And you see our model is able to handle the sparsity variation quite well with graceful degradation as the sparsity decreases. And this was done by basically incorporating this into the training. So in conclusion, we demonstrate for the first time that detailed images of a scene can be recovered from sparse SFM point clouds. This has serious privacy implications, which we hope will inspire the community to develop privacy-preserving techniques for 3D mapping and localization. Actually, the first paper on this topic, privacy-preserving localization, is actually being presented here at CVPR by some of my co-authors. And I encourage you to visit their poster uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you. Uh, so Now, 
take questions from the audience, but before we do that, is the first speaker in the room? <laughs> yeah, right now, go. Go. Sorry for the wait. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ho. I'm the first author. I'm, uh, today, I'm going to present our work on a new algorithm for robust uh, bonds cloud re registration without correspondences. So in this problem, um, we are given two sets of points in three dimensions that may be contaminated by noise and outliers. And the goal is to estimate the rigid body transformation, namely a rotation and a translation that best aligns the two point sets. Practically, this problem is tackled using correspondences whereby we first extract the invariant key points on each point cloud, and then we search for the set of PST correspondences. And finally, we run a robust estimation algorithm, such as RANSAC, to obtain the set of optimal inliers as well as the final alignment. However, there are some problems with these approaches. For example, the extractive features may become low quality or unreliable in very highly noisy settings. Therefore, um, algorithms such as RANSAC may require a large number of iterations to provide a satisfactory solutions. Therefore, uh, sometimes we design an algorithm that directly estimates the transformation from the raw input point cloud particularly rather than extracting key point and conduct robust estimation, we propose to directly provide the optimal inline set so that we can achieve the desired transformation. Um, our work is uh, very closely related to other well-known approaches that also solve the same problem. For example, iterative closed point or four point control and sets. For ICP, we alternatively estimating the correspondences and the transformation, but it requires good initialization. For PCS, on the, on the other hand, is another randomized approach that uh, search for the control and sets to estimate the transformation. The key observation that inspire our work is that given two sets of points that are partially overlapping, algorithms such as graph matching can be used to obtain the set of optimal inliers. However, graph matching is computationally expensive for our data sets. Because of the difficulties of graph matching, we propose to embed small problems of graph matching inside a randomized pipeline. In particular, we sample larger than minimal subsets on each point cloud. We then solve graph matching on these sample subsets using semi-definite relaxation to obtain three or larger hypothesis correspondences. We then use the obtain correspondences together with ICP to align point cloud and record number of inliers. So this process is repeated uh, until a stopping criterion is achieved. Here we show the result of our technique. Uh, in this experiment, we conduct registration on uh, our synthetic data set where we vary the outliers rate from 10 to 50% on around 10,000 points. As can be seen, our methods of choose a higher number of inlayers with comparable or even faster runtime than our state-of-the-art approaches for this particular problem. We also conduct experiment on real data sets. Here we show some uh, experiment on the Redwood data set, and the same conclusion can also be drawn when we see that we achieve the highest number of inlayers and uh, with faster and, com and comparable runtime. The interesting point for our approach is that this can be extended to problem with non-correspondences. Here we show, we compare our approach with uh, standard grand set approach. W when we apply our approach, we can achieve comparable or higher number of inlayers while the runtime is significantly faster than traditional approaches.
In conclusion, in this work, we propose a new randomized algorithm for robust point cloud registration without correspondences. The, the main idea is that we embed small problems of graph matching inside a random sampling mechanism. Um, the experimental results show that our methods outperform uh, current state-of-the-art approaches. And the cool thing is that our approach can be extended to problem with non-correspondences. Thank you for your attention, and uh, we look forward to your visit at post 72. Thank you. Take questions for all speakers at the same time, so please uh, step up to the mics. Okay, so since, or at least by the time anybody steps up to the mic, let me ask uh, Francesca a question. Uh, what is your advice to users? So there is a privacy threat. Uh, what should people do? Um, well, I think if, if you... No, the, the, like the, if we, one thing is to not be on the internet, not have a smartphone. If we don't want to do that, what, what can we do to protect our privacy? So one solution, as I, as I mentioned in the last slide, is actually proposed uh, here at CVPR. It's a CVPR poster paper, um, which looks at instead of having a 3D point cloud, they basically create a 3D line cloud, which still enables camera localization, but makes it more difficult to perform the inversion process. And so along these lines, there can be other creative solutions to basically still enable the uh, task that we want to achieve without compromising privacy. Any other questions? Uh, I'd like to ask a Tosin question. Uh, you mentioned one of the issues with uh, RGBD, I mean, off-the-shelf RGBD sensor is the rolling shutter effect. Currently, you're using the, uh, I mean, the infrared light from RGBD sensor. Is there still a rolling shutter effect in terms of the lighting? Um, that, so, I would assume that the, the infrared projector that we're using is has some sort of rolling shutter, yes, but what we are doing is we're project using a standard sync ASUS X-Sync to project light into the scene, but we have then two synchronized global shutter infrared cameras that actually do stereo on top of that signal. So there might be shutter in the, um, in the sensor, but that doesn't matter because by the time we do stereo, we don't have the shutter effect. Uh, let's move on to the uh, talk four, five, six. Hi, I'm Gil Junam, and this is a collaboration work with Cheng Lei Wu, Min Kim, and Yasser Sheikh. So let me start with a fundamental question. Why do we want to reconstruct hair? Why does it matter? It matters because hair reveals much about your personality. So if you want to create an authentic digital avatar of yourself, it's important to reproduce your hair as it is. But even the state-of-the-art techniques to create digital avatars often lack realistic hairstyles. They have achieved great success in reproducing facial expressions, but as you see, hair is still missing. This is mainly because hair is one of the most challenging objects to reconstruct. It has microscale structure, and there are a large number of hair strands. Also, there is a variety of styles and shapes. For these reasons, Traditional 3D reconstruction methods are not applicable to hair. And here we introduce a new method to reconstruct 3D hair models with strand level accuracy. The input of our method is multi-view images and the output is a 3D model of hair strands. The key insight of our work starts from rethinking traditional multi-view stereo. Traditional methods 
assume that the target object can be modeled using 3D planes and try to reconstruct the 3D surface using photo consistency of multiple views. So traditional methods such as call map reconstruct hair geometry as a 3D surface like this. It fails to capture the granularity of hair strands, especially on many flying hairs. So we break the assumption and replace the 3D plane with a 3D line and propose a new line-based multi-view stereo. Using the 3D line structure, we design a novel cost function based on the orientation consistency. And this line-based multi-view stereo is the key contribution of this work and makes it possible to reconstruct hair strands with unprecedented accuracy. Here's the overall reconstruction <coughs> pipeline. It starts from multi-view images and their 2D orientation maps. By using our new line-based multi-view stereo, we get a point cloud of 3D line segments. From the point cloud, we reconstruct hair strands. This step is analogous to surface reconstruction methods in traditional approaches, and it is also one of the key contributions in this work. We then grow the hair to elongate short strands and recover missing strands. This step significantly increases the reconstruction completeness. And we get the final hair geometry. Here we show the op reconstruction overlay between a captured image and the reconstructed geometry. Our method can accurately model all the flying hair strands as well as the overall shape. Here's another result. Because we do not assume specific types of hair, but just reconstruct hair strands, we can easily deal with different types of hair. In this case, the curly hair is well captured using our method. And here's another example, it's long and bright hair. In our paper, we have demonstrated our method with various types of hairstyles, including curly, straight, long, and short hair. Lastly, we apply our method to a video sequence of a dynamic scene. We reconstruct the video frame by frame independently, but we can still see the temporal coherence of the strands. This demonstrates both the robustness and the accuracy of our method. Please visit us at the poster session. Its poster ID is 75, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Jung Jun Park, and today I'm going to present Deep SDF. Then this work was done with Pete, Julian, Richard, and Steve. Deconvolutional networks, which are a cornerstone of image-based approaches, grow quickly in space and time when directly applied to voxels. More compact representations, such as point clouds, do not describe surface, and triangle meshes come with unknown number of vertices and topologies. We present a new representation that is more efficient, expressive, and fully continuous. Our models produce high quality continuous surfaces with complex topologies and obtain state-of-the-art results in shape reconstruction and co completion while having orders of magnitude smaller network size than voxel-based methods. Our key idea is to directly regress the continuous sign distance field using a neural network. A sine distance function is a volumetric field where the magnitude of a point represents the distance to the closest surface boundary, and the sign indicates whether the point is inside or outside of the surface. Thus, the shape uh, is implicitly represented as zero level set, where the SCF value is equal to zero. And we regress the sine distance function using a fully connected neural network. This neural network takes input as XYZ coordinate and outputs the predicted SCF value of that position. 
To model a data set of shapes, we condition the network using a latent code Z. This latent code encodes the information of a shape that can be interpreted by the decoder network. Now the question is how to obtain the meaningful latent space of shapes. Traditionally, this was done by training an autoencoder. However, it is not clear for us how to design an encoder to process a continuous sign distance function. And to avoid designing an encoder, we introduced a learning scheme that we call autodecoder, where the code is directly optimized through backpropagation. During training, we randomly initialize a code for each training shape. The code is then attached to an XYZ input, and given the ground truth SDFs, we can jointly optimize for all individual codes and the decoder weights. After training, we have a latent space of high quality shapes. During inference, we find an optimal code that best explains the input shape using gradient descent. Note that during the optimization, the trained decoder weights are kept frozen and only the code is optimized. Inference can be done for reconstructing a full 3D shape, but our autodecoder formulation allows inference on arbitrary number of STF samples. For example, finding optimal code from a single depth map. Here we show a visualization of the inference process. The optimization tries to find the best code that matches the single depth map observation shown as green dots in the middle. For rendering, we can cast rays from each pixel until it meets a zero crossing to obtain a depth map. Note that surface normal is calculated by taking gradients at XYZ positions through backpropagation. Furthermore, we can also apply marching cube algorithm to extract the mesh. Our deep SDF performs significantly better than previous methods in representing unseen shapes and shape completion tasks. Compared to octree voxel based method, deep SCF provides higher accuracy model with surface normals while having 100 times smaller network size. Compared to the state of the art mesh based method, deep SCF shows much higher expressive power. And here's another comparative result. For shape completion, given an input single depth map, Deep SDF finds a high quality optimal shape for the observation. And compared to the ground truth, it generates much higher quality completion results than the state of the art. Please also find the related works at this CVPR. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pratul, and today I'll be talking about view synthesis. There's been a lot of recent progress, even including work at this conference, in using a specific approach to synthesize novel photorealistic views of scenes from a small set of captured images. This common approach shared by many recent view synthesis algorithms is that they predict color and alpha layers sampled within a reference camera frustum and render novel views by warping and compositing these layers. This representation is based on early work in volume rendering and was more recently called a multiplane image, or MPI, in a paper that trained a deep network to predict an MPI from a stereo pair, using only the loss from rendering a held out novel view as supervision. So here's an example input pair and their extrapolated views. We were inspired by these results and wanted to figure out the limits on views rendered from this representation. So views near the inputs are very convincing but the quality of rendered views rapidly degrades as the viewpoint moves further from the MPI reference frame, and we observe two main problems. First, we start to see depth discretization artifacts, like the lines on this wood table where the separation between planes becomes very apparent. And if we pay attention to regions that are disoccluded in novel views, like behind this lamp, we see the repeated texture artifacts where disocclusions contain copies of foreground content. We specifically address both issues to allow far greater viewpoint movement than prior work, and here are views rendered by our algorithm for the same scene. 
So first, let's talk about depth discretization artifacts. We show that there's a limited range of views that can be rendered from an MPI with full spatial resolution. The frequency content of any rendered view lies on a 2D Fourier slice through the 3D Fourier transform of the MPI volume, and further rendered views correspond to steeper slices. There's a limited range of views where the slices contain the full spatial bandwidth, but views outside this range intersect a linearly decreasing range of spatial frequencies. We can see that the rendered view corresponding to this slice contains a smaller range of spatial frequencies and will therefore have a lower resolution than the original MPI. Fortunately, increasing the MPI's disparity frequency support by predicting more planes linearly increases the renderable range, allowing us to render further views corresponding to slices with steeper slopes with full spatial resolution. We train a 3D network to predict more high-resolution MPI planes than can fit on GPU during training by, by randomly sampling spatial and disparity resolutions that fit, so the network can learn to use a receptive field equal to the maximum size in each dimension at test time. Now let's talk about the problem where disocclusions contain repeated copies of foreground textures. We might expect each MPI plane to only contain content present at that depth, but training with view supervision learns to predict MPIs that copy foreground content from their initial depth all the way back to the furthest plane, as we see in this front-to-back sweep of MPI planes. So those repeated textures of the lamp we saw before are just the extruded copies at further planes peeking through. Our solution is a two-step MPI prediction procedure. First, we softly remove all occluded content by computing the visibility of each MPI coordinate in the reference frame, and then we multiply the initial MPI content, shown on the left, by this visibility, resulting in an MPI that only contains the first visible surface, shown on the right. Next, a network inpaints the occluded content at each plane, but we restrict its inpainting palette to visible content at or behind that plane. So the inpainting palette of any plane shown on the left is restricted to the corresponding plane on the right, which is the accumulated visible content from the farthest depth up to that plane. This constrains the appearance of occluded content to only depend on further content. Let's take a look at an example plane behind the lamps on the right. So here the network is trying to inpaint content occluded by the lamps using the palette on the right. We can see that it does a reasonable job continuing the wall and curtain textures behind the lamp on the left and continuing the landscape textures behind the lamp on the right. Because each step we've described is smooth and differentiable, we can train this entire pipeline end to end to minimize the loss from using the final MPI to render a held out novel view, as in prior work for predicting MPIs. Now let's take a look at an example result. Here's an input image pair, and here are views rendered by the prior state-of-the-art algorithm with zoomed crops on the right. Here are the same views rendered by our method, and notice how views rendered by our method ameliorate the depth discretization and repeated texture artifacts seen in the prior work. Please visit our project page for more details and results. Thanks for listening. Thank you for the speaker. Let's, uh, we have three minutes for questions for all the speakers. Uh, if you have a question, please come forward to the Michael's way on each side. Any questions from audience first? Okay. Maybe let me start from why. Uh, okay. I'd like to ask uh, uh, the first speaker uh, here, reconstruction, a very impressive result. Uh, you're using lie-based sterile matching. Uh, I wonder uh, empirically, uh, minimally, how many views do you need? I mean, multi-view reconstruction in order to reconstruct uh, such an impressive result. Are two views sufficient? Well, thank you for the great question. It, th I think theoretically two views can generate a 3D line if you're lucky, but in practice we used um, four neighboring views for a single reference view, and that worked fine with us. And for a complete hair capture, of, of course, the more views works better. The more views you have, better, better, better it works. 
Thank you. We have questions there. Yeah, the, all fantastic talks. Uh, love them. But for the last talk, the problem on the table surface maybe wasn't just a depth discretization because you were also looking at an area where there was a strong specular reflection, which might move in a way that's inconsistent. Have you dealt with uh, that kind of case? Yeah, that's a great question. So this kind of representation is representing um, diffuse and specular objects only as diffuse objects with um, opacity. And so if you kind of take a look at what um, the networks learn to predict, it kind of, it's predicting, um, or it's estimating like a virtual depth for any specularity and placing a diffuse, con diffuse content at that virtual depth. And so you can imagine that kind of support for this uh, two layer style rendering of these specularities is only valid for a limited range of views. And like in reality, specularities on curved surfaces don't even live at a single um, point in the world. So yeah, this kind of repro this, um, representation is gonna definitely be an approximation for rendering specularities. And um, you know, there's other ways to get around that. And I think there's a paper that's gonna be at SIGGRAPH this year that looks into like blending between these style representations to better approximate like a specularity locus. Uh, okay, uh, I will take two more questions. One here, the other here, then we switch to the next session. For, uh, uh, for the author, for strand accurate, uh, sorry, for strand accurate multi-view hair capture, uh, you talked about changing the assumption from surfaces to lines. And uh, so how doesn't this affect the, uh, the, uh, the, depths, the, the depth estimation, your depth estimation step, changing from uh, 2D surfaces to only 1D lines? So traditional methods tries to find, for a re for given reference view, it tries to find, for each pixel, it finds the depth and the plane surface normal. So similarly, we try to find, for each pixel, the depth and the line direction of for that pixel. So the pipeline um, is the same, but we change the assumption and the uh, geometric primitives. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Final quick question. Quick, quick yes, question. actually about the same paper. I'm curious if hair length has an impact on the quality of your results. It seems like longer hairs might work better in the matching process. Could you speak to that? Um, from our experience, the shape of the hair the, or the length doesn't matter because we do not assume specific types of the hair. So um, is that, was yeah, that? Sort of, the, the results were mostly sort of, uh, looked like women with longer hair. I was curious if it would work for a buzz cut or a beard or something like this. Uh, yes, uh, for the, we believe it also works for the beers. Um, yes, please, please come to the post the session for the further for the yes. questions. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you, let's thank the speaker again next session. Hello everyone, this is the presentation of our paper, Guided Aggregation Net for End-to-End -end Stereo Matching. The project is a cooperation between the University of Oxford and the Baidu Research. For stereo matching, there are three key steps, feature attraction, matching cost aggregation, and uh, disparity estimation. We focus on the matching cost aggregation because there are already many effective methods for feature attraction and dis disparity estimation. But the feature-based matching cost is often ambiguous and produces a lot of wrong matches. For matching cost aggregation, currently only 2D or 3D convolutionals are widely used for deep neural network models. But there are many effective traditional methods which are uh, usually geometry and optimization based, including the famous SGM and the cost filter framework. Our target is to formulate traditional geometry and uh, optimization into the deep neural network models. For the, sorry, for uh, our contributions are to guided aggregation layers. The first layer is a semi-global aggregation layer, which is a differentiable SGM, SGM and uh, it could help aggregate over the whole image. The second layer is a local guided aggregation layer, which helps learn uh, guided filtering kernels to refine these structures. The zero matching problem can be formulated as an energy function. The first term of the energy function is the sum of matching costs, and the second term is the smoothness penalties. 
In the semi-global matching, the author proposed an approximate solution using the cost aggregation. This is the famous SGM equation, but it's hard to be used for deep neural network models. The difficulties is, first, the user-defined parameters are hard to tune and are fixed for all locations. And secondly, the minimum selections only produce zeros and are not immediately differentiable. We improve the SGM equation to get our SGA layer. First, we change the user-defined parameter to get our learnable weights which are also adaptive for different locations and different scenes. Second, the second minimum is changed to maximum selection. This helps us maximize the probabilities at the ground truth labels and avoid zeros and negatives. And finally, the first minimum selection is replaced with the weighted submission. This has been proven effective in the paper or convolutional net, and there is no loss of accuracy. It also helps to reduce the frontal parallel surfaces in large textualized regions. We also improve the cost of filter framework to get our LGA layers. We learn guidance, with, uh, guidance filter kernels for each pixel in the image to recover loss of accuracy in dot sampling and refining structures. This is the network architecture. We focus on the cost aggregation step and use an etc. neural net to learn guidance weights for our SGA and RGA layers. Our, LG, our SGA layer aggregate in different directions over the whole image, and our RGA layer could help refine the scene structures in a local region. In the experiments, in the experiments, we find that our method far outperforms the state of art in both scene flow set and the outdoor KT scene benchmarks. And also, compared with the traditional SGM, our method could avoid most of the frontal parallel surfaces in the large textualized regions. Now the code and the pre-trained models are available at GitHub, and uh, all discussions are welcomed during the post session at 78. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alessio Tognoni from University of Bologna, and today I'm going to present our work on real-time self-adaptive deep stereo. Depth estimation is a crucial technology for any application that requires information about the 3D structure of the world, like robotics, autonomous driving, and augmented reality. Among the depth sensing technologies, stereo camera can provide accurate measurement at a low cost as required by the above application. Stereo depth estimation has been traditionally addressed by a pipeline of four macro steps, feature extraction, cost volume creation, regularization, and disparity estimation. Nowadays, instead, state-of-the-art approaches collapse the four steps into a single deep neural network that takes RGB image as input and directly regress the density disparity value as output. These models are typically trained end-to-end -end by supervised lossing, given the high number of parameters require many annotated samples. However, producing pixel-wise depth annotation is cumbersome and costly, as it requires specific sensor setup as well as a lot of human effort. Thus, the common practice in the field is to perform most of the training on synthetic data, where the annotation can be obtained for free during the rendering process. After training, we still wish to use our network on real images. However, the performance that we usually get are quite unsatisfactory, due to the domain shift between the synthetic train data and the real test one. Good performance can be regained by performing few iterations of fine tuning on some real samples. Yet, for this process, we will still need annotation, uh, depth annotation for any target environment, which is impossible in practice. Several methods to train depth estimation model without the need of ground truth annotation have been recently proposed, and among them, photometric consistency losses enable models to be self-supervised and relying only on the stereo images and are particularly attractive due to their computational efficiency. 
Since we cannot rely on the offline availability of images for any target environment, we propose to avoid the split between the training and the test phase and continuously fine tune online a deep serial network to the current domain as soon as new frames are sensed. Following this paradigm, the network will be able to tune its parameter to the current environment and the model will be able to self-improve its prediction over time without the need of ground truth. Continuously training the network can be computationally expensive, however. To address this limitation, in this work, we introduce a new modular, fast and accurate architecture for serial depth estimation called MedNet and an approximated training schema that we call MED. I'll now start by briefly describing our new architecture. Starting from the left and right stereo, uh, frame of a serial couple, we extract the feature at multiple scale using a pyramid of stride convolution layer. From the feature at the lowest resolution, we build a cost volume using a correlation layer and fed it to a disparity estimation module to get an initial low resolution prediction. This initial prediction is, use, is used at the higher resolution to align the right feature to the left one before computing another cost volume. Therefore, each higher resolution estimator needs only to predict a refinement of the lower resolution initial disparity. This process is repeated until quarter resolution, and then the final disparity is obtained after a residual refinement model based on author's convolution. The final architecture is modular and fast, doing most of the computation at the lower resolution while being remarkably accurate. Compared to other fast architecture in the literature, we have a similar speed but slightly better accuracy. Even with a fast architecture, continuously training the network online can be computationally expensive, requiring for each frame a forward pass, a complete backward pass, and an update of all the parameters of the network. Repeating this process for each incoming frame results in a drop of inference speed to about one third of the forward pass only, a, a performance penalty that is often too severe. For this reason, we have developed MED, where first we perform a forward pass of saving all the disparity computed at different scale. Then we use an heuristic to select one scale that will be trained at this duration, scale free in this case, and compute a loss function directly on the low resolution prediction, disparity free in this case. Then we perform an approximated backpropagation among layers work working at the same resolution, and finally update their parameters. This strategy backpropagates roughly across one fifth of the network layers, speeding up the frame rate a lot. The following video shows the results we obtain adapting online MedNet per trained on synthetic data to a real environment without any kind of supervision. From top to bottom, left to right, we show a reference image, the prediction of the network trained only on synthetic data, fine tuned online with full backpropagation and with MED. Finally, at the bottom, we report a plot of the percentage of wrong pixel versus the number of processed frames. We can see after a few sensed frames, the full adaptation is already able to drastically reduce the error, improving the performance by roughly 30 points in as few as 300 steps. Due to its approximated nature, MED requires more training step, but given enough iteration, is able to catch up. At, at around 1,500 iteration, obtains a similar gain in terms of performance. The plot show how given enough adaptation step, the true strategy even out, but MED provides still 10 frames more per second. We strongly believe that fast and self-adaptive machine learning systems are the key for a more widespread diffusion of this kind of system in real application. MedNet, together with MED, provides the, this capability for stereo-based depth estimation. All our code is already available on GitHub, and we have a poster, number 79, and a live demo, it's number 10, and it's tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to our presentation. I'm Sung Young Kim from EPFL. Today, I'm going to present a paper, LAFNL, locally bearing a, a fusion network for stereo confidence estimation. This is a joint work with uh, Sun Ok Kim and Kwang Eun Sun from Yonsei University and Dong Bo Min from Iwa Women's University. Stereo matching aims to find the uh, disparity and uh, this depth map from stereo image pair by estimating the dense correspondence between the images. Due to its, its uh, challenging factors such as the uh, textual less, reflection, occlusion lesion, and illumination variation, stereo matching still uh, uh, remains an unsolved problem. Stereo matching pipeline formally consisting of the matching cost computation and matching cost aggregation and regularization. However, in most methods, there exists the discrepancy between the estimated disparity and ground truth disparity map. So stereo competence estimation aims to find the only reliable pixels of the disparity map. As you can see here, stereo competence represents the reliable pixels as a high value and unreliable pixels as a low value. To extract the reliable competence, most current uh, CNN-based methods have been formulated by partially using single or bimodal inputs, such as the input disparity only, matching cost only, disparity and matching cost, and disparity and color images. In this paper, we propose the 
novel confidence estimation network called the uh, RAFNet that utilizes the uh, trimodal input such as the uh, color image disparity and matching code simultaneously. Our locally adaptive fusion network uh, consisting of the four sub network. The one is the feature exchange network, attention inference network, scale inference network, and recursive refinement network. The feature extraction network are designed to extract the confidence feature from each, uh, each trimodal input by using separated confidence uh, network. However, due to uh, their heterogeneous attribute, the direct concatenation of the trimodal input cannot provide a reliable performance. So we propose the attention inference network that, that infer the attention for each pixel. With the locally bearing attention and element-wise multiplication, we can, attend, we can attain the attention positive features as follows. As you can see here, the, each attention map shows the most important region of each modality input as follows. On the other hand, the optimal receptive field for confidence feature can vary at each pixel. So in this paper, we also propose the scale inference network that infer the optimal scale per each pixel. It infer the optimal scale at each pixel first, and then we wipe the intermediate features with the this scale field. Finally, we also propose the recursive refinement network where the previously estimate the confidence can serve the guidance of current confidence estimation. Uh, with the four network, we can show the experimental lizard. This is the relation study for input trimodal data and three sum network. As you can see here, using trimodal input and three sum network, List the uh, substantial performance gain. In the qualitative evaluation, our RAFNet has shown the state of the art performance comparing to the most, uh, most state of the art CNN based method. In the quantitative evaluation, we measure the average AUC of sparsity curve. As you can see here, our method has shown the state of the art in quantitatively. To conclude this paper, we have shown that uh, using trimodal input leads to substantial performance gain with the attention and scale inference network with the recursive refinement network. Uh, thank you for listening. If you have any question or something to discuss, please come to our post booth. Thank you. And we'll now take questions for all authors. Uh, so let me ask a question for the uh, uh, JNET paper. So uh, uh, you create a differential version of SGM by uh, replacing the min-max operators with a weighted sum. Does this uh, result in any loss of accuracy? So you replace the min-max operators with, yeah. with a uh, weighted sum. Does this, does, does this have any effects on accuracy? Uh, yeah, actually, actually, it could help to avoid most of the frontal parallel surface compared with the original SGM. You will find that uh, for the large textless regions, uh, the traditional SGM could produce a lot of frontal parallel surface, but uh, by changing the minimum selection to the maximum and uh, changing the uh, uh, first uh, minimum selection to the uh, weighted summation, it could avoid this uh, uh, frontal parallel surface. a question for the second author. Um, so, my, can't hear me? Uh, uh, so in the adaptive stereo uh, network, uh, it's, uh, so it's very interesting what you're trying to do. Now my question is, when you do this adaptation on a really long video sequence, mm -hmm. do, do the, does the parameters of the network ch keep changing continuously or do you observe some kind of stabilization over time? 
So the, the parameter continues to, continues to change because we are continuously training the network. But if you look at the performance uh, e after uh, around uh, uh, 300 or 400 training iteration, they start to saturate. But we still keep training the network because we don't know what is going to happen in the future. So if the environment is going to change drastically, e we still need to uh, uh, update our network. So like think about a car entering into a tunnel or a sudden change of weather or something like that. So then a follow-up question is, so does this, this will, if you do this extreme uh, all the time, then it will lead to catastrophic forgetting. Basically, the effect of the training set will go away. Can you comment on that if you have any insight? Yeah, so right now we are not directly addressing this problem. The only things that we are doing is that we have a sort of watchdog and we keep track of the loss function. When we see that the, the loss function is starting to diverge and the prediction of the network are starting to don't make a lot of sense, we just reset the network to the initial parameter. But for sure it's uh, quite interesting to study better this effect of catastrophic forgetting. Uh, let's, thank all, let's thank all the speakers again. And can the speakers of the next group please come up? Hello, everyone. My name is Chen, coming from Huadong University of Science and Technology. It's my great honor to be here making this presentation. Our work is named as NM Knight, Mining Reliable Neighbors for Robust Feature Correspondences. <coughs> Finding consistent feature correspondences between two images rely on two key steps, feature matching and correspondence selection. Initial correspondences can be obtained by matching local features around key points, such as shift. Due to various nuisances, mismatches are often inevitable. To address this issue, correspondence selection can be employed as a post-processing to ensure correct matches and reject mismatches. <coughs> Typically, the nuisances are included but not limited to viewpoint changes, scale changes, rotation, and illumination changes. Learning to find good correspondences is the first learning-based method towards correspondence selection to the best of my knowledge. This method uses MLP to e extract features and employ context normalization to fill global information. However, each correspondence is individually processed without any local information involved. <coughs> so, our major motivation is trying to integrate some reliable local information because local information has been the cornerstone in many learning-based methods for image or point cloud classification and segmentation. As shown in the finger B, for a query point in a point cloud, the spatially adjacency is semantically consistent. This consistency makes sure that spatially local information is reliable. However, directly using spatially local information for feature correspondence selection is not a good idea because the distribution of outliers is irregular. For a query layer, there are many outliers contaminating the local regions around it. So the spatially adjacency is inconsistent and unre unreliable. Therefore, we present a compatibility metric to search for reliable neighbors for correspondences. This finger shows the difference between spatially KNN and our compatibility specific KNN. The spatially selected K nearest neighbors of an inlier are located in an adjacent region, but they are incompatible with two outliers included. By contrast, the neighbors picked by a compatibility metric are consistent, but their positions are not necessarily to be uh, spatially adjacent to the query inlier. The network architecture is shown in this figure. We use a grouping module to ex extract local information for each correspondence, while compatibility specific KNN search is adopted and we employ a set of ResNet blocks to further learn feature embedding. For the implementation details, please refer to our paper. 
Next, I will show some uh, experimental results, including the performance on single consistency and multi-consistency data sites. On narrow, wide, and core map data sites that contain single consistency, we achieve the best performance from the perspective of F measure, making a well trade-off between precision and recall. The, vis the visual results also confirm the superiority of our work, which achieves more consistent selection results with fewer false matches. For multiple consistencies, our method is able to pick out all kinds of underlying consistencies, which are represented by different colors, because NM Knight is trained with a pure classification loss without any global transformation constraint, such as the regression loss in LGC Knight. In a nutshell, we have proved that compatibility specific mining is more reasonable than spatially k research in the field of corresponding selection. It improves the robustness of the selection. We present a, a hierarchical classification network named NM Knight, where the compatibility specific locality for each correspondence is fully mined by a compatibility metric and further explored by convolution neural networks. That's all. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Matthew Traeger, and uh, I'm a postdoc at New York University. But this is work that I did during my PhD with my advisors, Marcel Hebert and Jean Pons. So in classical multiview geometry, Carlson Weinschel duality basically states that scene points and camera pinholes play almost symmetric roles. More precisely, for a particular type of projective camera model, sometimes known as a reduced camera, the projection of a point X from a pinhole C is the same as a projection of a, pinhole, a point C hat from a pinhole X hat, where hat denotes this nonlinear involution that acts on projective points by inverting all of the coordinates. This fact is remarkable, and it can be used to develop dual versions of reconstruction algorithms, where the role of pinholes and, and scene points is swapped. On the other hand, based on this description, the role of the involution in the duality is difficult to understand geometrically, since these expressions appear to rely on particular choices of coordinates and camera models. In fact, if we take a purely geometric perspective, there's actually no need for the nonlinear involution. For example, three incident lines can be seen either as viewing lines from three scene points and one pinhole, or a single scene point and three pinholes. The symmetry in the setting is complete, but this picture does not provide a geometric interpretation of the involution that appeared in the previous formulation. For this, these reasons, the first motivation for our paper was to bridge the gap between the geometric and analytical perspective and to understand carlson weinschel duality in a way that does not rely on particular coordinate choices. To do this, it's convenient to introduce the notion of point configurations. A configuration of points is simply an equivalence class of points in projective space up to projective transformations. It's easy to see that a camera can be seen as a mapping on configurations. Indeed, given n points in projective space, the configuration of these points together with the pinhole uniquely determines the configuration of points in the image. This perspective actually provides a natural framework for multi-view geometry, given that the reference frames in 3D space are usually not uniquely defined. It turns out that carlson weinstall duality can be understood using classical work on point configurations by Arthur Kobel, dating back to 1915. In short, Kobel observed that the effect of permuting points in a configuration corresponds to nonlinear transformations known as Cremona maps. Even though Kobel's work does not involve cameras, we know that configurations of points and pinholes determine images, and we can recover a coordinate-free version of carlson weinstall duality. In order to go full circle and return to coordinates, we need a way of parameterizing configurations of n points in m-dimensional projective space. The simplest way to do this is to fix the, fix the first m plus two points as a reference frame and use the coordinates of the remaining points to parameterize the space of configurations. For example, to, determine, to describe configurations on the plane, we need four points to act as a projective reference frame. Using this idea, we can recover expressions for the reduced camera model appearing in the standard formulation of a carlson weinschel duality. We also investigated some of the algebraic constraints arising in reduced multi-view geometry. For three views, triples of corresponding points can be characterized using trilinear polynomials and image coordinates that can be expressed as determinants of simple matrices. 
This is very similar to classical results in multi-view geometry, except that the particular trilinearities that we consider in our paper admit a geometric interpretation in terms of line transversals. And perhaps more importantly, we prove that among all possible trilinear polynomials, the ones that correspond to valid trilinearities of this form are characterized by linear equations in the coefficients. This contrasts with traditional trifocal tensors where the coefficients are known to satisfy complex internal constraints. This also suggests that the coefficients of our trilinearities can be estimated easily from image data and used in multi-view reconstruction. And in our paper, we present a preliminary algorithm for doing this. For more information, please come see our poster number 82. Uh, Finally, we can use duality to characterize triples of points in the same image that are projections of the same fixed three points for an unknown reduced camera. This leads to constraints with the same exact form as in the primal case, but where the role of the pinholes is replaced by dual scene points. Of course, the coefficients of each of these polynomials are also only constrained by linear equations. In summary, we have revisited carlson weinstein duality from a coordinate-free perspective. We have investigated reduced trilinearities, and we have shown that the coefficients of these polynomials are constrained by linear equations. By interpolating reduced trilinearities, we also obtain new methods for projective 3D reconstruction. Finally, in the future, we would like to run more experiments using our, our algorithm, and we would like to further investigate the geometry of Cremona transformation and the relating to, relation to multi-view reconstruction. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Zhang Zhaoxuan from Dalian University of Technology. It's my honor to be here to introduce our work. Our post number is uh, 83. Our task is to 3, 3D scene completion from a single depth image. And to be specific, our goal is to recover the missing information in occluded regions. Given a simple depth image, we first reproject it to the point cloud. And uh, you can see there are some regions are missed. So we wish to recover these points and uh, output the completed point cloud of the scene surface. Here are some related works, SSC net, view volume net, and uh, scan complete. But all these works, the output is volume and is of low resolution. So we wish to uh, predict the point cloud directly and uh, output the high resolution results. Here are our key ideas. First, we transform the 3D completion task to multi-view 2D depth map in painting tasks. And then we do sync completion by doing in painting view by view progressively. And we choose reinforcement learning to determine the optimal sequence of views. And below is our baseline. Given a single depth map, we first reproject it to the point cloud, and we feed it to the view truth network. Under the output viewpoint, we project the point cloud to depth map, and then we impaint it, up to update the point cloud, and uh, do the uh, projection, impainting, updating again and again, finally, we got the completed point cloud. <clears throat> Uh, to achieve better performance, we add the volume guided part. Uh, while reprojecting the depth map to the point cloud, we also feed it to the SSC net to output the volume completion. And we project the volumes to cause depth maps at the same viewpoints as the point cloud use. And we combine the two depth maps as the input of the impending network for better impending. And it is worth mentioning that the projection layer is differentiable for joint training. And here are some ablation study results. <coughs> the last rule is the error map. And for the view pass planning, we define the problem as a Marco decision pro process. We define the state as the updated point cloud after each view in painting. We uniformly sample K viewpoints near the scene's center as the action space. And for the policy, given state, uh, the agent predicts the next action by the MVC CNA based classification network, also called DQN. And uh, the reward is composed of uh, two parts, the accuracy reward and the whole error reward. Uh, 
and uh, we define the term terminal as the state that all the holes are nearly filled up. Uh, here are uh, quantitative comparisons. Uh, there are two indicators we used in our work, uh, chamfer distance and uh, completeness. Uh, the volume GT means the volumetric version of uh, ground truth point cloud, which indicates uh, the accuracy upbound of all voxel-based methods. Uh, we choose SSCNet, ScanComplete, and their corresponding volume GTs to do the comparison. And we also do the ablation studies uh, with U5, U10, and uh, uh, DQN without hole. And the last column is our results. Uh, next are the quantitative comparisons. Uh, the first row are input and the GT, and uh, below from left to right are uh, the results of SSCNet, volume GT, and uh, ours. Uh, here are ablation study results. Uh, also from left to right, uh, there are U5, U10, DQN without hole, and ours. Uh, you can see different uh, uh, choices of view paths will lead different uh, noises. Uh, also, we test our network on NYU distance and also get bad, uh, good results. And that's all. Thanks for listening. Uh, it's time for question for all the speakers. Any questions before you? Okay. Uh, I have one for the second speaker, Matthew. Uh, well, you demonstrate that you can derive a coordinate-free duality between, I mean, camera and points for two view, three view, uh, maybe four view. Can you keep doing this for the, I mean, multiple view in general case. Can you comment on that? Uh, yes, the, the duality is uh, complete between points and scenes for any number of views. The only, the only limitation is you have to exclude four points from the scene points, so it's between n camera, n pinholes, and m plus four scene points, but for any n and m. But this, this is actually kind of classical, not very used, but it's, uh, it's classical multi-view geometry. Thanks for the question. Uh, thank you. I uh, think you're going for the morning tea. Let's thank all speakers again. This concludes this session. <laughs>